Hey, it's Harley. This episode may contain mentions of emotional abuse, which can be distressing to some listeners. It might get heavy at some points, so if it becomes too much or too overwhelming, please take a breather and listen later. If you or someone you know is having a mental health crisis or thoughts of suicide, dial or text 988 to get connected to a trained crisis counselor 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Crisis counselors listen empathetically and without judgment. Your crisis counselor will work to ensure that you feel safe and help identify options and information about mental health services in your area. And if you're listening to this podcast from overseas, visit findahelpline.com to get free confidential support from a helpline or hotline near you. That's find, F-I-N-D, A, helpline, H-E-L-P-L-I-N-E dot com. Remember, you are loved and you are wanted. What's up, everybody? This is Harley, and welcome to the third episode of the Unapologetically Spicy Podcast. Getting out of an abusive relationship is one of the hardest things a person can go through. It's not often that we talk about the aftermath and the grief that comes with it. I didn't always see my relationship as abusive. And I know that's a scary word for everyone. And sometimes for me, it's scary to admit, but it was, my relationship was abusive. When I first met my now ex fiance, I had shared with him my relationships, traumas, just how past people, past men had treated me. He assured me that he would never treat me the way that I was treated before. And I believed him. Despite some of the red flags that I saw in the beginning, red flags that I thought were pink because I had rose colored glasses on. He gained my trust. And eventually, I fell in love. Deeply in love. I thought he was my person. My forever person. I wanted him to be my safe space amidst the chaos. I wanted to spend forever with him. I wanted to have a family with him. And he seemed like he wanted to have a family unit with me. We were going to build a home together. Together. And that's one of the hardest things about breakup in general. Or heartbreak. Letting go of someone who you thought was your one and only. Someone who you thought was your home. Someone who you made a ton of inside jokes with. Someone who you shared so many firsts and experiences with. Someone whose name you'll never forget. No matter how fast or how many years go by. Someone who you may have slept next to or held their hand or kissed. Someone who you hoped would be the last person to touch you. For the longest time, people kept telling me either how sorry they were or to just leave. I'm so sorry you're going through this. I'm so sorry he did that to you. He sounds so awful. He is so awful. You should just leave. Why don't you leave? 
why don't you leave? If he's so bad, why don't you leave? I lost friends because I couldn't leave. And I feel like they don't think about how hard it is to say goodbye. Sometimes even shattering. But the reality of it, the reality of it all, is the agonizing pain of the aftermath. It's waking up in the middle of the night when you have a nightmare, turning to cuddle them, but they're not there. It's that random time during your day, whether it's your work shift or you're just going through life, doing chores, driving, and you remember and start reminiscing about how they used to brighten up your day. It's thinking about ordering your favorite foods and then being gutted because you used to do that with him. It's listening to or singing certain songs in your car or in the shower with tears running down your face because they remind you of him. It's remembering how you begged them to love you. It's remembering how you gave them all of you and more, more than you gave anybody else. For them to barely give anything back. It's remembering how you settled for the bare minimum. <laughs> it's realizing how you allowed yourself to turn into this broken soul, a shell of what you once were. And how every time you tried to walk away, all they had to do was hold out their hand, flash a smile, tell you how much they love you, how much they need you, how they can't live without you. And you're pulled right back in. Right back in and grateful that the person, that this person puts up with your emotional ups and downs or what they call your overreacting and you believe no one else will <clears throat> so you wait you wait for them to choose you you wait for them to give you the time of day to be done with their work day to be done with life things because you believe no one else will choose you. It's exhausting and depressing to look in the mirror and feel so unwanted and that no matter how hard I try, I just wasn't good enough for them. I begged for him to respect me, to be kind to me, to love me. He was supposed to love me. He was supposed to treat me with courtesy. He was supposed to listen to me and to hear me. And that really question, makes me question my worth. Was I worthless? Am I worthless? Was I not worthy of being treated better? Did he ever want me in all these years? Did he ever actually choose me? <laughs> and then once you finally move forward, once you finally say, you know what, enough is enough. And once you think you're finally free, you're actually not. Because they're still on your mind. They still metaphorically occupy your bed. They still have stuff at your place. Stuff that they were in a hurry to leave behind so they could move on. And you're scared to admit it. You're scared to say it out loud because of what other people will think, what other people will say. But the truth is... 
it's so painful that they're gone, that you just want them back so the pain will stop. And you desire so deeply to be wanted by them that you forget the importance of being truly valued and appreciated. So you think, and you overthink, and you wonder if, were you the reason? Did you cause them to treat you so badly? But guess what? No, honey, you did nothing wrong. You had to walk away. You were not the reason to be treated so badly. And then you start to wonder, maybe I should have hidden parts of myself so I could be loved properly. Maybe I should have taken better care of myself when I was either emotionally or physically sick so they didn't have to think about it or worry about it. But no, honey, you did nothing wrong. You did the best that you could with the spoons you had. And maybe they weren't even thinking about you or worried about you when you were sick. So then you wonder, were the jokes that they made, the jokes that freaked you out or frightened you or made you uncomfortable, did you take those jokes too seriously? No. You didn't. Because the jokes, they could be scary and uncomfortable. At least for you, they were. I mean, joking about disconnecting your phone even after you told him to stop? That's scary. And he always talked about how your feelings are valid. And in a weird, twisted way, he's right. But to him, probably not the feelings that he didn't agree with. Those were the feelings that he probably thought you were overreacting to or with. Do you wake up every day with varying degrees of heavy emotions? Because for me, sometimes the emotional and mental load is bearable and I could get through the day just fine, maybe with some thoughts of them some thoughts of what life used to be like, the good times. But then sometimes the emotional mental load is so heavy, so heavy that I could feel it as I'm walking up the stairs. And I go through my day in a fog, wishing and praying that I get to finally go back to bed, wishing for some relief. Wishing to see the sun again. Wishing for another chance, another shot at happiness. Wishing he thought I was good enough to experience real dates with. Real dates with more than bare minimum effort. Wishing he thought I was good enough to give flowers to. more than just a half-wilted three flowers that he found. Good enough to be complimented and called beautiful multiple times a day and not told because I'm wearing makeup and a beautiful dress that I'm more beautiful than usual. Good enough to be treated with respect and made to feel important to him. Good enough to feel like I mattered. Good enough to be taken care of and comforted when I'm not okay. Good enough to have my love and effort reciprocated back. Good enough for genuine love and to be accepted for who I was. Who I am and who I was going to become, who I'm destined to become in all of my seasons. The grief of the abuse makes you doubt if you were good enough to begin with. 
but trust me and believe me and hear me when I say that you are, you are more than good enough. But to get through the grief, to get through this grief, you need to feel it. Everything. All of it. The pain, the yearning, the aches. You need to hear the screaming in your head. Hell, maybe you even need to scream out loud. Maybe you need to scream into a pillow and cry and yell at yourself. Why did you stay for so long? There will be days or nights or both where you barely move from your bed or your room. And if you do move farther than that, just take that as a win. But during this, you will break and break and break again. Allow that. Go through the misery. Because there's no time limit. No one tells you. No one can tell you how long it will take for you to heal. But then suddenly one day, you'll see the sun. Suddenly one day, the what if questions will stop. Suddenly, your nightmares will be gone. And suddenly one day when you look in the mirror, you won't be exhausted or depressed or feel unwanted. You'll look in the mirror and see you. Beautiful, radiant, irreplaceable you. You'll see how far you've come in general, how far you've come in moving on. You'll see how strong you are to build yourself back up. And when love visits you again, it will be safe. It will be secure. It will be genuine and reassuring. It will be everything you need, everything you want, and more. But for now, mourn. Feel the grief and talk about the aftermath. There's no shame in it. I see no shame in it and you shouldn't either. It's okay to miss who you thought he was. It's okay to miss who you used to be. It's okay to grieve. I realize that the grief that you may experience after being in a toxic or narcissistic relationship is not just limited to people who are neurospicy like I am, but it is more common because we can't always see the signs of a toxic relationship and that's definitely what happened to me. Um, I know when I released my last episode, don't call it a comeback, um, I submitted a poll or I published a poll asking you guys what you wanted to listen to next in the next episode. And someone voted that they wanted me to start the bonus series. So I'm, I want to tell you that I am writing the bonus series, um, I'm in progress of writing the bonus series as we speak. It is going to take some time to write and get through it because it's a very personal story and I want to make sure that it is as accurate as possible, even if it doesn't paint me in the best light in some instances. Um, and also having to go through and relive certain things. It's a mix of traumatic and slightly traumatic I'll say and um, 
relieving. I don't even know if that's the right word I want to use because I can go through and share with you guys things that you can avoid if you're looking, if you're somebody who's looking to date or be in a relationship forever for the rest of your lives. <laughs> if you're looking to get married one day. Um, but again, back to the point of this episode, the grief of the abuse, there are going to be some, you're probably going to react to the narcissistic abuse in a different way than I did. Some people are going to feel a combination of anger, betrayal, shame, and sadness after recognizing what's happened. And I experienced all of those. And for me, it was very hard to leave because I was waiting for that person to change because I loved them. And it made things more difficult because there was a child, not mine, but a child in the picture. And I felt intense guilt and shame that I felt like I couldn't make it work for this child. I wanted the child to have positive influence and two parents in their lives. I wanted them to be happy. And that caused me to feel a disconnect, an intense disconnect from some other people in my life where I um, just felt like I couldn't relate to too many people. And my self-esteem dropped significantly. I stopped doing things that I liked. I had different hobbies. Like, I couldn't get the motivation to sew or play my violin or anything like that. Because I felt like I could not do those things. I had to be focused on my person. I had to be there to help with child rearing I had to do the cooking and the cleaning and then on top of that the stuff in my own life like work and school and all of that was just really distressing and isolating and it was hard um these are all effects of narcissistic abuse and like I mentioned earlier, it is going to take some time to recover. There's no set timeline or guidelines for how long it will take to recover from narcissistic abuse. But the first thing, two very important things, not the first thing, two very important things that you want to make sure you do is you need to label the abuse and end the relationship if you haven't already. I know... When I was in a relate, my last relationship, we had this really terrible cycle where we would break up and then get back together again. Um, they would promise to change. They would beg for you to come back. They don't want you, they don't want to be alone. And then maybe they change for two weeks and they stop because they have you, they convince you. And when you finally end the relationship permanently, maybe they'll try to smear your reputation to others. I know I went through that. And my current boyfriend went or is going through that. And maybe I'll even have him on an episode so the men that listen to this can have somebody to relate to when a woman is doing it. Because I can't necessarily speak to a woman doing it. But anyway, the first two things and most important ways to recover is to label the abuse and then end the relationship if you haven't already. Seek immediate support as well. So you will need people to validate and comfort and help you. So reach out to your trusted friends or family or I haven't done this personally, but consider joining a support group for survivors of abuse or domestic violence. And even if you suffered abuse a long time ago, you would still benefit from 
seeking support now. I know right now I am working on developing, redeveloping my friendships. Because like I mentioned, I lost some friends while in my last relationship. And I don't necessarily blame them. They were, they tried to be as supportive as they could, but after a while they couldn't help anymore. They were still my friend, but we couldn't talk about, <coughs> excuse me, we couldn't necessarily talk about the relationship part. And it really sucked, for me at least. Get a sense of routine. It may sound crazy, but if you can make a schedule, this is something I want to do for myself. And this is also why I'm so devoted on to making sure I'm consistent with this podcast and releasing episodes twice a month, like I promised in the beginning or, you know, every couple weeks, because the consistency will give me something to... It will give me a foundation and peace of mind when I'm scattered. And I already knew this is going to happen, but the grief, again, the grief, it is okay to grieve. It is complicated and you will want them back. Maybe you'll just be in bed all of the time and it sucks. But as you go through your healing process, the grief will come less frequently. With the grief, you should also make sure that you forgive yourself. Because you need to realize that it's not your fault. It is not your fault that you got into this relationship with this person because like autistic and ADHD or ADHD people, narcissists can mask really well and they mask for so long that you never noticed the signs. And once you got comfortable, once they became a part of your everyday routine, that's when they got comfortable and started taking off the mask. So forgive yourself. Forgive yourself for not seeing what was happening. I'm still working to forgive myself. And speaking of, also implement some more self-care. I know when I released my episode, The Stigma, I asked again in the poll what people wanted to listen to and someone voted self-care. So another episode I'm working on in the background is just, you know, writing down all the ways that I self-care, but trying to make it um, in a way that is accessible for everybody because not everybody has money. Not everybody can do all the things that I like to do. Because for me, I like to pamper myself. <laughs> and sometimes it may be hard, but take time before you jump into dating. And maybe, maybe you decide to distract yourself with somebody new. Make sure, so there are no hurt feelings, make sure you're up front with that person. Let them know what happened. Because you're fragile right now. And you don't want to get attracted to another toxic person. Grieve and reconnect with the people that support and love you. But if you're like me and you jump into dating somebody new, Make sure you do intentional dating. Um, I could speak more to that. 
in another episode, which is something I'm working on with my therapist doing intentional dating. Um, but these are things like doing, going on a grocery store run with them or purposely trying to be in a stressful situation, not pick a fight with them necessarily, but maybe as much as I dislike them, <laughs> maybe do an escape room together and see how they handle stress. Um... Make sure you create new rituals as well. Because, again, with the grief, you're going to realize that every Sunday before the work week starts, y'all lay in bed together and scroll on your phones or watch a show or something like that. Or maybe every Wednesday you guys had a date night or something like that. Create new rituals so that way you won't necessarily get triggered by the, your sense of longing or anger or sadness about the relationship. And the most important thing out of all of this is to reflect on what you learned and to get a therapist. Because it's easy to dwell on all the negative parts of the abuse And that's fine to remind yourself of what happened. So you don't, so you try not to repeat these in the future. But also take time to remember how you grew and how you learned. And that's one thing I want to do with this podcast is I want to grow and learn and gain perspective from you guys, my fellow listeners. Because going through life, surviving narcissistic or toxic abuse, and going through life as a black neurospicy person is undoubtedly really difficult. And it'll take time for us to heal. And you'll feel like that you're regressing. I know sometimes I feel like I'm regressing. And progress isn't always linear. And it's important to continue focusing on how you could take care of yourself and move forward. So make sure, again, you lean on somebody. Make sure that you are taking care of yourself. And remember that you are loved and you are wanted. What you went through is not your fault. What you went through is not your fault. If you're vibing with me, make sure you drop the unapologetically spicy podcast a follow on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcast fix. Follow the podcast on Instagram at unapologetically spicy pod or on X, formerly known as Twitter, at unapolo spicy pod. Want to talk about the podcast online? Use hashtag unapologetically spicy pod to start the conversation. Leave a comment on the show's page on Spotify or leave a review on our official Facebook page. Tell the important people in your life about what we're trying to do here. Until next time, lovelies, stay spicy.